God, we are so thankful that you are enough. God, we walked into this room and walked into this building with all kinds of things in our lives, but as we come now with our family, and as we surround your throne of power and grace and goodness, we praise you, God, for being who you are. We praise you for being greater than anything that is happening outside this building and even anything that would attempt to come into this place. God, we give you all glory. You are enough, God. You are enough. We thank you and we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody said, amen. How are we doing this morning, Crossroads? I'll tell you what, looking out, we have been here, there, and everywhere this summer. How many of y'all, how many of y'all took a trip to the water, the lake, or the beach, or the swimming pool at some point? Show of hands. All right, we're still awake. That's good. That's test number one. All right. How many of you all uh, went on a mission trip this summer? Y'all know we had almost 70 people go on mission trips this summer here in the country and around the world. Isn't that great? So one of the places where we do missions, we took two trips this summer, is in Honduras. And one of the awesome things about Honduras is we get to go back and we get to visit churches that we were a small part in establishing. So this year, on the Sunday we were there, we got to worship with the Kane Church, which Crossroads helped plant five years ago. In fact, two of the women that literally laid the brick on that build were on this trip and got to worship with the church. It was awesome. So when we go over, sometimes we'll talk to our partner, Pastor Freddie, because he has us speak and, and teach and preach when we're there. And I'll ask him the question, Pastor Freddie, are there any topics that you feel like would be really pertinent or necessary for the church right now? And he usually says, no, my missionary, he says, whatever God tells you to preach, he'll know and you'll know. But this time he said something different. This time Pastor Freddie said, missionary, he said, my people are struggling. He said, this church's pastor died unexpectedly just a few weeks ago. He said, this is a really small church. And he said, this is a really poor community. And for him to say that where the entire country is not like what we're used to is saying something about the, the pain that they have. He said, people are hurting. He said, pastor, could you just give our people a little hope. He said, maybe when you come preach, could you just remind the church that there's something waiting that's even better than this? Can you relate to that? Have you ever had a time in your life when you could just use some good old-fashioned Christian hope? You ever get tired of the politics, the culture wars, the kids? No, I'm just kidding. But you ever get tired of the stresses of life? Sickness? You ever get weary from constant spiritual warfare? You ever get sick of dealing with death? It's interesting, there's a book in the Bible, it's the book of 1 Peter, we're going to be there this morning if you want to open to chapter 1 and your, your old school Bible that Greg had us hold up last week, or you're at, but there's a, a book in the Bible, 1 Peter, that is written to Christians who are suffering and struggling. And the entire purpose of the book was to speak to those Christians and give them hope. And it's fascinating as you read through the book of 1 Peter, all the things he mentions to help God's people appreciate the beauty of the life that we have in relationship with Jesus. He says you've been purified from your past in chapter 1. In chapter 2 he said you've been delivered to walk in freedom. He says you're a part of God's own nation, God's own family. You get to share with the sufferings of Jesus. And he goes through all these blessings of being with God with Jesus in this life. But what's fascinating to me is before he talks about any of the things in this life, he starts out 
And he says, if you are reading this book and you're a suffering or struggling Christian, I want you to understand that there's something beyond this life. We're in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So he finishes, be truly glad there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you endure many trials for a little while. We're going to end our summer series on a positive note, and we're going to tackle the question, what does the Bible say to Christians about our future The first thing Peter says is, Christian, your hope in Jesus is real. He said, we live in great expectation. So anytime I hear the phrase great expectation, I remember the summer of 1989. I was visiting my grandparents on their farm in Indiana. And we got word that Larry Bird was coming to town. Larry Bird, one of the two or three most talented and well-known basketball players in the world at that time, was coming to little Podunkville farm town, Indiana. He was going to come to the gym. He was going to speak to the kids. He was going to sign some autographs. I want you to picture the anticipation of a bunch of kids in a gym waiting for Larry Bird. Can you picture it? Now, I want you to picture the impatience half an hour after he's supposed to be there of the same kids in the gym. Now I want you to picture the frustration an hour after he was supposed to be there and ultimately the disappointment when all those kids in Indiana realized Larry Bird's not coming to this gym. Life's filled with disappointments, right? Right? How many of you buy lottery tickets? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Why would someone buy a lottery ticket? Did you realize there's a 1 in 282 million chance you actually win that lottery? 1 in 282 million. But today's the day I'm going to wake up. I'm going to have it. Guess what you wake up with? Disappointment. Life's filled with it. Peter says when we talk about our hope as Christians... We're not talking about disappointment. He says we're talking about expectation. We're talking about something that we're not wishing for, not hoping for in the way the word, the world uses the word. We're talking about something that we know is going to happen. How do you know it, Peter? Dean, how do you know it? Peter was in the room. in John chapter 14. When Jesus was talking to his disciples, you remember he started to talk about the fact that he was going to have to go away after his death and resurrection. They started to get a little bit nervous. He said these words beginning in verse 1 of John 14. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will what? I will what? I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Peter, why are you so confident? Why do you say we should live with expectation? He says, because I followed a man around who said he was more than just a man. I saw him do things no other person could do. I saw him say, they're going to kill me, and on the third day, I'm going to walk out of that grave. And guess what he did? He walked out of that grave. I saw him go up into heaven. I heard the angel say, he's coming back. He's done everything he ever did. Peter says, we can rejoice in the fact that as Christians, we have a hope that is real. And in this world, 
of counterfeits and fakes and grasping for straws. Isn't it great to, be, great to be able to actually hold on to something? But Peter's not done. He says our hope is real. He talks a little more about what's involved, though. And he talks about our hope involving victory. In verse 5 that we read, it says, Through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for us. Paul spoke about that final day when he said, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. Now, our series is not on the end times. We don't have time to get into all that this morning. There's too many things that we talk about, too many questions about what happens when and in what order. But here's one thing we do know. There's going to be a shout and there's going to be the sound of a trumpet that signals the end. Question for you. What's so significant about a shout? What's the meaning of this final trumpet? Tyler, one of my 42 children, one of my five children, I'm just kidding. He's eight years old. He's really into the Bible stories at bedtimes right now. And one of his favorite stories is Joshua fighting the battle of that walled city of what? Of Jericho, right? If you hadn't read it, the story goes like this. God has Joshua leading his army into the promised land of Canaan. They're marching in. He's going to give them the land. He promised it. He said, just go in and take it. And one of the first cities they come to is this giant walled city of Jericho. So God meets with Joshua, his general, and he lays out the battle plan. He says, I want you to line up all the cannons that you can find. Is that what he said? No. He said, here's what we're going to do to take the, to take the city. We're going to march, Joshua. We're going to what? We're going to march. We're going to march around the walls of the city once on day one. And then we're going to wake up and guess what we're going to do on day two? We're going to do it again. We're going to do it again on day three, four, five, and six. And on the seventh day, guess what we're going to do? We're going to march around the walls of Jericho seven times. Sometimes God's plans don't make a lot of sense, do they? But my buddy Katrina said, hey, if God says something crazy, just do what he says. Sure enough, they go through, they begin marching. I want you to notice what happens after they march around the walls of that city like God told them to. On that last day, Joshua 6 says, the seventh time it happened, the priests blew the trumpets. Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord has given you the city. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout, the wall fell down Flat. Then the people went up to the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. God said, I've given you the land. And when they heard those trumpets, when the shout came, it was the sound of victory. God's done what he promised he was going to do. Now, as Christians, the Bible tells us very clearly that we should already be walking in victory. Doesn't it say in Colossians 2 and verse 15 that when Jesus went to the cross, he openly defeated principalities and powers? Doesn't it say in Ephesians chapter 1 that when he then came up from the grave, God raised him up and sat him on his right hand where he rules over all things in heavenly places? Didn't Paul say in Philippians chapter 2, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God? He's already won the victory. That's why the Bible says so many times, don't walk around sulking, worried, discouraged. Romans 8, 37, we are more than conquerors through Jesus. But there's still going to be something about that final day. When we hear that shout and we hear that trumpet and we have our ultimate and final victory. <clears throat> First Corinthians 15, Paul says, after that, the end will come when he will turn the kingdom over to God the Father having destroyed every ruler and authority and power. For Christ must reign until he humbles all his enemies beneath his feet. and The last enemy to be destroyed is death. 
How many of you have been to either Gatlinburg or Pigeon Forge, Tennessee? Okay, so most of y'all are familiar at least with it. So my, my best friend Andy and I took a road trip right after college, Gatlinburg. Put all our money together. It's the first time we'd ever been able. We rented a cabin, right? Figure out what we're going to do. And if, you, if you've been there before, you know that there's Gatlinburg and there's Pigeon Forge and there's a road that kind of connects them. There's a lot of cabins up the mountain and off the road. So we stayed in a little cabin up the mountain and off the road. We turned off the road. And as soon as we turned... It was like this. It's a bumpy ride. It's gravel. For, it's about a mile and a half going straight up the side of the mountain to our cabin. Well, my friend Andy is an elite athlete. Played professional baseball. Could have played professional football as a quarterback. And he, of course, as we're driving up the mountain, said, man, this would be really fun to run. So he said, I think if we get there and unload fast enough, we'll be able to get a run in before dark. Mile and a half all the way down, mile and a half all the way up. To this day, I don't know why I agreed that that was a good idea, brother, but I did. So we take off running. Y'all, I'm about a minute into this run, and you know what I realize? I'm an amazing downhill runner. I'm talking about I'm going, I'm feeling good, I'm keeping up with my professional athlete friend, Andy. And we get to the bottom, we turn around, we go about 10 steps, and I remember saying the words, dude, this isn't as bad as I thought it would be. And then I remember maybe 10 steps after that, I was done. And I buckle over, and I'm sucking in wind. Andy's a great friend. He said, hey, you want me to go get the car and come back and get you? And I just gave him one of these. <laughs> so he disappeared up the side of the mountain. Well, at this time, it's starting to get dark, Steve. It's starting to get dark. You know, there's some things out there. So I, I'm starting to realize I might not be the only one on this road. So I thought, you know, I'm just going to start walking back up. I've gotten my bearings. I'm going to start walking back up this hill. And by the time it was pitch black, I hear a noise. It's kind of off to my right. And it's the sound of a, a, a large, I think, branch breaking. And then I hear another sound. And Emmanuel, I imagine it's probably what a mountain lion sounds like. And I look out in the trees, and keep in mind the road falls off, so as I'm looking in the trees, I'm looking about 20 feet up the tree over here, our teenage section right here. And I see two big yellow eyes that blink at me. Guess what, y'all? I became an amazing uphill runner, too. <laughs> I mean, I took off. I beat my friend Andy, who's the professional athlete now. And we got to the top, and we're jumping up and down, and we're giving each other a high five, and we're celebrating. And he said, I don't know what we're cheering for. And all I could say, because I was really out of breath, was mountain lion. Mountain lion. Can you imagine the celebration? Can you imagine the celebration when Jesus ushers in our final victory? We're not running up any more mountains. We're not worried about that lion who's seeking whom he may devour, a different kind of lion. We will have made it. And can you imagine the shout and the joy when we have that victory and we make it to that amazing place called heaven? No wonder, no wonder Peter says, be truly glad. There is great joy ahead. So y'all know I'm old-fashioned. I like to count them out, right? So first of all, Peter says we have a hope that is real. Second, Peter says we have the hope of victory. Third, when we get that victory, guess what? We have the hope of a place called heaven. Our verse 4 says we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. I want to go back to a question Greg asked last week. We worked together on him, we just didn't know it at the time. He asked the question, why do you want to go to heaven? And I'm going to ask a tag-along question. What do you think of when you think of heaven? Maybe you think of the 
the beauty of heaven. Right, Revelation 21, he talks about seeing a new heaven and a new earth and that new city, the holy city of Jerusalem coming. And he says it's like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Y'all ever sit out and see one of those neon pink Georgia sunsets? I know y'all do because you post them all over social media. We saw the same ones, but it's beautiful, isn't it? My brother and his family are kind of doing their bucket list trip this summer. They got three weeks and they piled all their family in a van and they're driving out west. And they're seeing the Rocky Mountains and they're seeing Yellowstone National. You ever driven around this country and thought, wow, our God made this? You ever gone to a different place in the world? Maybe on one of our mission trips, maybe it's the the amazing views in South Africa or the mountains of Honduras or the jungles of India. And you think, wow, our God did all of this. My question for you is, if this world demonstrates the beauty and the awesomeness of God, what do you think heaven is going to be like? I get excited about that, y'all. How about, how about that new body? How about that new body that we're going to get in heaven? Come on, somebody. How about that new body we're going to get in heaven? Philippians 3. Paul says, we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. We're going to come back to that in a minute. And we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. Watch it. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own. Using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Now, as I was reading and preparing for this message, I've read this verse many times, like most of you had, and God showed me something I hadn't thought about before. Who wrote this verse? The Apostle Paul. You know what's fascinating is? God used the Apostle Paul to heal people. You remember that? Even his, even his handkerchief. Remember the old school preacher handkerchiefs? We don't have those as much anymore. Maybe Greg does. I don't know. I don't think some of us do. But he used Paul to heal people. But you know what? Paul talked about the fact that he had to live his entire life with a thorn in the flesh. It's fascinating to me that God used Paul to heal others, but there was an area of life that God chose not to heal for Paul. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. And so here you are, you're the apostle Paul, and you get to write these words about a new body in heaven. No arthritis in heaven. No walkers and wheelchairs in heaven. I was talking to a sister one time. She came in and she had a difficult time coming inside. I said, how are you doing this morning, sister? And she said, The cold, wet days are really hard on my body. It just doesn't do what it used to. She said, but I'm glad to be here. She kept on walking. She got about this far away. She turned around and she said, hey, pastor, when you get to heaven, if you can't find me, just wander over to the dance section. Because she said, me and my body going to be having a good old time in heaven. What do you think of when you think about, I'll tell you what I like to think about. I like to think about what won't be there. How about Revelation 7, starting in verse 16. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorched by the heat of the sun, for the Lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life-giving water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You know, when I hear people talk about heaven, somehow we Americans work food into it, right? I can't wait to go to heaven because I'm going to eat all the chocolate I want. I'm never going to gain a pound. I'm going to go to heaven because I can have an endless supply of barbecue ribs and chicken wings. I want to go to heaven because in heaven that Krispy Kreme hot light never goes off. The reality is the Bible says absolutely nothing about any of those things. 
But what it does say is, no more hunger. Why do we have a pantry two days a week and one day a month on Saturday? Why do we have a thrift store where all profits go into taking care of those who need clothes and food and the basic needs of life here and around the world? Why do we go to Honduras and distribute water falters so people can actually have clean water to drink? Why do we go to South Africa and partner with a church and organization that feeds 850 kids every single day? Why do we have a sponsorship where you can say, I'm going to give some money every month and I'm going to take care of the needs of a child in India? We have all of those things because we live in a sin-cursed world. We live in a place that man messed up in the beginning and it's only gotten worse as we go and because of that we deal with things like hunger and homelessness and sickness and death. John sees into heaven and he says, as I'm looking into heaven, guess what? I don't see any of those things in heaven. I'll tell you one of my favorite things about heaven from that same passage in Revelation 7 is who will be there. Can we show the picture that I have on screen? I think I might be jumping ahead of one passage in my notes. So I mentioned we worshiped with the church in Kane. Little church, there may be 40 people there besides us. And halfway through the service, they said, come on up. You, know, you got to understand with Pastor Freddie, you're going to get to meet him one day. We're trying to make it this fall. We'll see if the visa authorities agree with us. But you're going to get to meet him one day. And Pastor Freddie, he likes to just kind of fly by the seat of his pants. So we're halfway through the service. He says, come on, American team, get up here on stage. Lead us in a worship song. And so we sang the song Waymaker because they know it in Spanish, and we sing it in English. And, y'all, as you look at that picture, how many of us are there? About, about 12 of us on that, on that screen? You have people whose families come from Mexico, Haiti, Puerto Rico, and the mainland U.S. just on that one screen right there, not even including the people from Honduras. You have people representing three churches in the U.S. There were people from four churches in that little church on Honduras as we met. You have people in that picture who were born in Pennsylvania, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Puerto Rico, California, Indiana, Massachusetts, and I might be missing one. We were singing that song. They're jumping in with the Spanish. And I couldn't help but think, how awesome is heaven? going to be people from all over the world coming together and reuniting to worship the lamb who was slain forever and ever listen to this passage in revelation 7 beginning in verse 9 after this i saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hand. They were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. They sang Amen, blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and strength to our God forever and ever Amen. Do you want to go to heaven? (laughs) Who's going to be there? I'm pretty excited to be able to look out and see you right there worshiping alongside me and my family in heaven. I'll be excited every time, every time we tell Freddie goodbye, he cries like a baby. And he says, you know, I never know if this will be the last time I say goodbye to you here on earth. I can't wait to see Freddie and my Honduran family worshiping in heaven. I'll be excited to see, is that that Noah over there? Noah, what was it like living in an ark for a year? Peter, we all know you eventually sank, Peter, but what was it like when you got to walk on water just there for a few seconds? To see people, and worship with people that we miss in this life because they went home before we did. But it all revolves around the one who is on the throne. We're all going to be there 
But this isn't some barbecue family reunion type deal. This is a lot more like that worship that we had earlier, and it just goes on and on with our loved ones and the faithful forever and ever. Can you imagine what it's going to be like? You see that lamb on his throne in the distance. and You walk up and for the first time get to say face to face, Jesus, I just want to thank you saving me from my sins. I want to thank you for helping me walk in true freedom. I want to thank you for bringing my family to spend an eternity with you in a place like this. And that leads to the last one Peter points out, and that is, as we've talked about all those things, maybe the greatest thing about all of them is that our hope will last forever. He talks in verse 4 about an inheritance that is beyond the reach of change and decay. He talks about joy ahead compared to the brief sufferings of this life. You know, that's one of the things about this life. Things are temporary. Ever gotten a new car? Or maybe you know somebody who got a new car. One of the questions is, oh, who's going to dent it first? Don't point at your wife, brother. Who's going to dent it first? You like that new car smell? That car is going to smell like grandkids and Cheetos within a year. But that's what happens in this life. I talked about Freddie at the airport. He says, I always get so excited that it's almost time and then you get here and, and it's gone. You know the feeling, right? That vacation is just over too quickly every single time. Our hope will last forever. Peter paints a pretty good picture of our hope, doesn't he? What's interesting is if you start at the book of 1 Peter, and it's all the way near the back of the New Testament, and you kind of shuffle all the way to the end, you go to the book of Revelation, we find what I personally think is the greatest thing about heaven from a human perspective. Revelation 22, talking literally the very last page of the Bible, it's verse 17. The Bible says, anyone can come. Anyone. Old school King James says, whosoever will, let him come. You know, there's a lot of things in this life that only some people can enjoy. There are a lot of things in this life where you have to have special access. Y'all, I like to golf. I like to watch golf. And I, this is about two years ago. I guess it was two years ago. I won a drawing for a ticket to the British Open Championship in Scotland. So I'm like, okay. And when I got there, I realized it wasn't just a normal ticket that I won. It was actually a VIP pass to an exclusive restaurant over here. Only about 40 people could go in. I walk up, tuxedos on, the men open the door. Welcome, Mr. Campbell. Come in and sit down, choose from. And I thought, they hadn't figured out I don't belong here yet. But it was a great day, I'll tell you that. There's a lot of things in life like that that not everyone can enjoy. Let me tell you something. Heaven is for anyone. And God wants everyone to be there. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter where you're from. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should have what? Everlasting. The greatest hope we could ever have is a hope that anyone can have if you go through Jesus. In that same passage where he said, if I go, I'm coming again, two verses later, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. 
here's my question for you. We've had a summer series where we've been answering questions, and now I want to close by asking a question. Do you have that hope that Peter talked about? Are you walking every day in the greatest relationship you could ever have? A relationship with a risen Savior named Jesus. And do you have the hope that says, I'm not worried about what happens to me in this life. Because he's promised it only gets better ahead. If not... God, we are so thankful for your goodness. God, we are thankful for your grace. God, we are thankful for the hope that you have given us in Jesus Christ. God, if there's someone here today who has never had the courage to take that step to come and give their life to Jesus, we ask, God, that you move in their heart in a mighty way so that they would understand the, the only way to live in this life is with the hope that he offers. And God, to all of those here today who have given their life to follow the King of kings and Lord of lords, God, I just ask that you give them a reminder of the incredible hope that we have. Remind them, God, that there's nothing in this life that is greater than our joy. There's nothing in this life that can take away our hope. And remind us, God, that at the end of it all, we will get to celebrate with the faithful who have ever lived around the throne of your awesome son, Jesus Christ. God, we thank you again for who you are and for what you've done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and worship as we prepare to do that. If you've never given your life to Jesus, we have an amazing prayer and baptism team. Come up, talk to them. They will tell you what it's all about. If you have done that but need prayers for any reason, the front is open. Let's worship the King together.